Welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast and our Q&A segment, Ask the Colson Center. I'm Shane Morris, host of the Upstream Podcast and one of the writers for Breakpoint. And I'm joined today by John Stone Street, president of the Colson Center and the host of Breakpoint. And today we're answering your questions this week about structural racism and whether it's real, the messages behind Disney and Pixar movies, especially the recent ones, and what to do if you've already got frozen embryos and have gone through the IVF process, plus much, much more. These questions were sparked by Breakpoint commentaries, short courses, articles, and the Colson Fellows Program. If you'd like to send us a question, all you need to do is email us at asktheColsoncenter at colsoncenter.org. John, the first question is about structural racism, as I said, and it's sort of a request to respond to a common line or a common claim that you'll hear about the status of racism in modern America and the modern world and what that has to do with this thing called critical theory. We've talked so much about this, but it's still very important, I think, to make the kind of distinction that this listener is asking us to make between recognizing systemic racism in the world as an extant reality, you know, without running over into an ideology like critical race theory. This person says, I appreciate you guys tackling tough questions and your thoughtful responses. I live in a rural area of central Pennsylvania. There's not much racial diversity here. A majority are Pennsylvania Dutch or Amish. You'd be encouraged as my pastor will regularly discuss cultural issues in his sermons, such as abortion, homosexuality, and transgenderism, as well as critical race theory. One of his big concerns is that evangelical leaders will downplay sexual sins, but are very outspoken today on racism. He's quoted one leader as saying, God whispers about sexual sins in the Bible. My pastor says he hasn't heard any good examples of modern day structural racism. I feel very naive about this issue. And my question is, besides abortion, what are some examples of present day structural racism? If so, any ideas about getting a better understanding of this? Yeah, I've heard that quote that God whispers about sexual sins. And I'm just like, what God is that? Sexuality is a really, really big deal in scripture. It's a really big deal from the beginning to the end. It's a big deal in Old Testament law. It's a big deal for Paul. It's a big deal. Paul essentially sets up the scope and impact of the fall in terms of what it did to the whole world in Romans chapter one and spends a lot of time there, not only on sexual sin, but of the disorderness of sexual desire. I mean, there's just example after example. So I, I've seen that quote. It's just so weird. So I would agree with your pastor that, that that's just bizarre. I, I, I don't know why we would say that. I do think that there is a tendency right now for Christians to speak out culturally on issues that the culture has already decided on. And if the culture hasn't decided on it, then we wait, we're quiet, or we, you know, we, we whisper about sexual sin. I, I think that's kind of a much more common feature. So I, I completely agree there. My concern on the issue of structural racism has to do with the fact that I hear so many people say, if somebody says structural racism, that's critical theory, and there's no such thing as structural racism in the Bible, or there's no such thing as it in general. But the problem is, is that's just not true either biblically or historically. The Bible, I think, lays out throughout history, maybe not structural racism, but certainly structural partiality. If you think, for example, about, you know, the, the, as Israel grew into a nation and Egypt, the Pharaoh basically goes after on a structural level, the expansion of that nation. Uh, remember, it's the Pharaoh that knew not Joseph sort of thing. And we, and we can also look in Old Testament law where God basically says, you know, you don't be guilty of this. Don't be guilty. You know, you, you need to be distinct. God seems okay with things like borders and laws and, and identity, you know, around kind of uh, Israel being this called out place, but they're not to show kind of a systemic sort of dismissal of other nations. And and it just goes on and on and on. Paul talks about it also in terms of the uh, access to the Lord's Supper, not systemically putting those who are poor out of the uh, best seats. You know, there's all that sort of talk in both the Old Testament and New Testament. In his book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, A Breviary of Sin, Neil Planig, I think, does a great job talking about both the personal and the structural aspects of sin and evil. We look historically in the United States, Jim Crow, 
obviously a form of structural racism. The idea that certain issues having to do with race, you could take the law outside of the system and take it into your own hands and largely be overlooked by the system. That's in and of itself as a, as a form of systemic evil and systemic racism. Now, I don't think that everything that today that is called systemic racism is. It's become the convenient hammer you know, and everything else is a nail. So anytime you have an inequality of outcome, the explanation a priori is kind of a, a, a racist sort of narrative. And I don't think that is the case at all on an awful lot of things that we point to. But it doesn't mean that nothing is. I mean, when you start talking about, for example, th there's data on arrest rates, there's data on rising conflict with, with law enforcement doesn't mean that every interaction is uh, an example of racism, and it doesn't mean that the systemic injustice that exists is itself racist. It could be the systemic injustice is because of all kinds of other evil kind of coming into play, you know, whether a breakdown of family or a lack of resources or, you know, there's all kinds of things that kind of play into this. One of the real problems of accusations of systemic racism as the entire narrative about structural evils is is that it's too simple. It leaves out all the other causes and all the other things that are part of it. So I think that whenever anybody asks me what's the greatest example of present day structural racism, I always say Planned Parenthood because that's what it was born as. That's what it has continued as. And that's we see now in terms of both in terms of methodology, in terms of where these clinics exist, in terms of the actual numbers of abortions on the backside. That is the best example of racism that is. And so I know that that the current champions of a kind of a critical theory version of structural racism want to pretend like they're the good guys and everybody on the right is the bad guys. But I think the greatest example of that is the exact opposite. Yeah, that's helpful, John. One thing I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into is this idea that the Bible it lays emphasis on certain sins above others and that those are the sins we should be thinking of predominantly. So when we hear this line that the Bible whispers about sexual sin or God whispers in the Bible about sexual sin, but shouts about injustices and so forth, that, that does require a certain selectiveness in the passages you cite. But is there a legitimacy to this whole idea that the Bible does emphasize certain sins above others and that we as Christians should be emphasizing them in the same sort of proportion. So if, if we want to talk about sexual sin, we should be willing to, to talk about systemic injustices or social justice issues in the same ratio that the scripture does. I mean, what can we really learn from the proportions of scripture's concern for this issue versus that issue? I, I you know, I'm not sure that's always really helpful. I, I, I do know that there are sins that are elevated in certain contexts. You know, for example, in Proverbs, which is a book about personal wisdom, there is this list, seven sins that God really hates. So don't do these seven things that didn't make it into the, you know, Moses's instructions to the children of Israel right before they went into Egypt for some reason. That has to do with personal morality. There's also clear instructions about national morality and family morality and the role of everything. There's a flawed methodology when you just count the references. So, I, you know, I don't even know what it means. God whispers about sexual sins because it's mentioned an awful lot. And when it's mentioned, it has pretty big consequences. It's equated, for example, with idolatry. And it's put into the list in Romans chapter one of how everything's going to hell, essentially, <laughs> because of, of the fall. It's clearly one of the things that distinguish Sodom, which is kind of this notorious story of, of, of corporate sin in Scripture. When I was growing up, I, I, you know, I would often hear pastors say, you know, the Bible talks more about this than it does about that. But that's not even helpful because, you know, the, the amount of times it's mentioned it, when you're talking about a story, it might just be like this was the first, you know, big problem. Like, you know, disobeying a direct command of God is a big deal, clearly, because it breaks the entire world in Genesis chapter three. What does it mean for the Bible to shout or the Bible to whisper or something like that? It doesn't mean that all sins are equal. I oftentimes hear that, you know, any sin separates us from God. I think is what the scripture says, but some sins have worse consequences than others because either they're done more publicly or they have a bigger wake from the, from the break. And, and all of this, by the way, is why I think Planiga's book is so helpful 
And I think it would be a helpful read, especially for pastors right now, because pastors have an enormous amount of pressure to talk about certain things. And if they don't, then they're being unfaithful. And then they have an enormous amount of pressure to not talk about other things. And if they do, then they're being cruel. You know, I, it's just, it's a hard place to be in. You know, we did a commentary this week on the surrogacy question because we noticed, you know, every time that we did something on artificial reproductive technologies, we get a flurry of feedback and, and they all kind of had the, the same response, which is that's just cruel to talk about it. Now, there is a cruel way to talk about sin, but it's not cruel to talk about something that's sinful necessarily. And uh, I think that that's a, that's a real challenge that pastors have right now. I wonder if part of the motivation behind this idea that the Bible resoundingly comes down harder on certain sins than others, and that we should be following that pattern is Jesus own behavior. And this, you know, you hear, you hear the line frequently that Jesus hung out with prostitutes and with tax collectors and with the the sort what we're seen as the dregs of society and reserved his harshest judgment for religious hypocrites. And I think there's a lot of legitimacy to that. The prophets even come down very hard on the injustices toward the poor and so forth. And, and Jesus does too, where he says, you devour widow, widows' homes and all that. I, I wonder what the legitimacy is of using a sort of straw poll of Jesus' moral condemnations of a particular context in, you know, Second Temple Judaism in the first century as a barometer of what morality should look like more generally. I mean, there's a lot that we could bring up that's very, very popular in today's moral discourse, even in, in secular circles, that Jesus didn't address a whole lot. I mean, Jesus never addressed human trafficking. He never addressed, you know, wire fraud. <laughs> he never, he never addressed he never really addressed systemic racism when you when you get right down to it. The closest that Jesus comes to touching on any racial issue is the the parable of the Good Samaritan, where he kind of tries to upend people's expectations about a, a hated minority group. But even even then, that's not you, you know the point is not about oppression. The point is about universal love for for mankind that your neighbor is everyone. Yeah, I think you're being generous to say that it looks more like Second Temple Judaism's context. I think it looks more like liberals. You know, I, I think it looks more like you know the progress. You know, Jesus being made in our own image. I mean, even just the fact that you're right, Jesus never talks about it. half of those things that are now put into that justice bucket today, and that you have to speak out strongly about, or you're not, you know, being just. And and you know what's not included in that list is the list of sexual sins that create a justice issue for children. This is something that I'm going to, uh, you know, this this will air, I think, on Wednesday. People will hear this and on Tuesday night. So we're we're recording this on Monday. This is airing on Wednesday. On Tuesday night, I'm having a conversation as part of our Lighthouse Voices series with Katie Faust. And that's been her key point is that there's a real justice issue here with as we've rethought these sexual sins that the Bible supposedly whispers about, whatever that means. And that is, is, is that we, we want to shout on justice issues today, but we forget that the sexual victims or the victims of our sexual innovations are children. This is a justice issue for children. We're going to get to this question a little bit later uh, about IVF, which is a really hard question. But as Katie Faust, I was working with her and talking to some Colorado legislators on a crazy bill that we're about to do. Get this. Only one in seven babies created through IVF technology are given a chance at life. Wow. That's a crazy number. Terrible odds. How is that not a justice issue? That's why I say it, it looks less like the justice categories of Second Temple Judaism and more like the justice categories of modern progressivism. Yeah, that's helpful. I, what I meant by that remark is that, you know, Jesus context is, is a particular context and he's addressing issues that are relevant in his time. So, but, but you're right. You know, when you try to map that onto a modern context, you end up uh, tear, tearing things out of context quite often. And so you get the ubiquitous use of, of just, you know, don't judge. All these different mentions have particular context, right? I mean, there is, I mean, there's a context where you're supposed to live for the good of the city and there's a context where you're supposed to stand up to the powers. I mean, there, there's just context where the Bible shouts about certain things in certain ways. And it's helpful to know what those, those are. But I mean, I guess by and large is we don't have to choose like the Bible walks and chews gum at the same time, so to speak. And so can we.
Well, uh, if we can if we can walk and chew gum at the same time, then surely we can talk about um, systemic racism and New Testament theology, and then move right into uh, talking about Disney movies. And that's what we're going to do next. Here, the next question is a lot of fun, and I think we will have a lot of fun talking about it. This person writes in: I want to hear two men's perspectives on the current focus of Disney Pixar themes directed at young girls. I'll preface this by saying I know lots of Christians who like Frozen and Encanto two recent movies, and I'm known to be a killjoy when it comes to most entertainment. I only saw the second half of Encanto and the preview for Turning Red, but I felt like that was enough. This theme is driving me crazy. Disney's perpetual follow your heart obsession has laser focused in recent years on a specific aspect, namely letting go of perfection and embracing your flawed self and making sure everyone else does too. It started with Frozen, with the song Let It Go, Can't Hold It Back Anymore, The Perfect Girl Is Gone, and it continues with these more recent movies. And then this person goes on to cite a number of examples and lines of dialogue from Encanto, Frozen, and Turning Red, and you sort of substantiate this claim. But what do you think about that, John? I mean, that that Disney has zeroed in on a, on a theme that, though it's been prominent in the past is now become a sort of obsession in recent movies. Well, I don't think it's recent. I think it goes back a long way. One of my favorite movies to watch with my son is The Sandlot, which is just classic. You know, I mean, it's, there's so much you got to love about that, especially for a little boy growing up in a home, you know, with only sisters and, you know, that sort of stuff, just that kind of boy experience. It's just a classic movie. We were watching it again the other day, and there's this scene where, you know, Benny the Jet, the, the fast kid, gets visited in his dreams by Babe Ruth, who says, follow your heart, you can't go wrong. Right. I don't know if it's a Disney movie. It's now on Disney Channel or the Disney streaming service. So maybe, you know, it has some connection there. But the point is, is they kind of they kind of scavenge stuff that was made by other studios. And yeah, added they to probably Disney do. Plus. But the point is, is that that's that same message. And I think you can go back to a lot of those movies you could see a distinction, right? I mean, you see the distinction between the sort of princess that Cinderella is and Beauty and the Beast, Belle is, and the sort of princess that Jasmine is. And of course, we all hate Ariel because, you know, she that that, that one completely, <laughs> the Little Mermaid completely screwed that thing up, right? I mean, but that's exactly like she, she wants something and therefore she gets it. And when she gets it, it's the good life, even though she disobeys her parents. That goes back a long way. I mean, it was in Little Mermaid. It's Hans Christian Andersen that, uh, you know, originally wrote that. And, you know, in the original... Her, her disobedience leads to her death. <laughs> you know, it's a completely <laughs> yeah. different, you know, outcome. So I don't think this is new to these recent ones, but you're right. It's very, very present. The interesting thing about Frozen, and I think, you know, obviously the song was really popular, but in the original Frozen, when Elsa or what are the two? I forget the two. I, it's been my, my girls have outgrown watching Frozen three times a week. If if I give you the right answer, I think I have to give up some kind of man cred card. as a That's man. That's probably true. So, yeah, I, I probably whoever the older sister is, she's the one that sings that song. And when she lives out those lyrics, it actually has real world consequences. And she actually, uh, in other words, just kind of being herself actually ends up in the death, almost death of her sister. So that's an interesting thing. I think all of these are really wonderful opportunities to have really important worldview conversations with your kids, especially because this is one expression and you can just walk around culture, including everything we just talked about in terms of sexuality. I just sent a, um, an article around to our editorial team this morning about you know, Adele, the singer, and a handful of others who basically divorced their husbands because Glenn and Doyle told them to, you know, to be true to yourself. It's just some British lady. She's like, my husband was great, but I just wasn't happy. And you're like, how is this fully internally focused perspective of life in the world? When did that become the definition of the good life as opposed to service, as opposed to looking? And see, that's, you know, one of the big differences between, you know, Belle, who serves her father, or Cinderella, who, who serves faithfully, you know, in her situation. And you know, there's just these examples where what it meant to be heroic in older movies in older Disney movies even has really changed. And what it's reflecting, I think, is not just embrace your flaws as if you don't need to work on improving yourself, although that's part of it. But it's that idea that Carl Truman talks about from Robert Bella, which is this expressive individualism. There's no vertical reference points in life. There's nothing outside of myself to orient my life around. 
my orientation is internal. And the example that I often use is like you're going into the woods and you have a compass so you can navigate your way around and out of the woods, but the compass always points to you. How helpful is that going to be? <laughs> you know, a compass that always points to you is, is, is basically one that you, in which you're always going to be lost. We've been talking about this lately in editorial team, too. If you go back and read, I point everyone to read The Parable of the Madman by Frederick Nietzsche. In it, Nietzsche is basically trying to argue in, in a parable form the consequences of a world that loses God. When he said God is dead, he didn't mean God lived and then God died. What he meant was the idea of God had died in public life. And because of that, there's going to be an awful lot of consequences. The world that had been previously oriented around some sort of transcendent truth and reality and morality was going to lose, but they weren't ready to really embrace that. I am increasingly confident that what he predicted in the parable of the madman has now, we're now seeing, we're seeing a crisis of meaninglessness. We're seeing a crisis of identity. We're seeing a crisis of relationship. And what, what happens there is that the madman gets, even jumps in, you know, to these intellectuals and he's like, if God is dead, how do we know what's up and down? What's going to heat us? You know, how, what, it, aren't, aren't we just getting colder and colder and colder? Because what source of warmth? Isn't it getting darker? Because we don't have any source of light. And and aren't we, and this is my favorite phrase, aren't we straying as through an infinite nothing? And then, and then the key line, must we ourselves not have to become gods to, to appear worthy of it? In other words, we're going to have to become God. If God's dead, somebody's going to take his place. It's going to be us. Now, he saw that sort of in that Uber match sort of powerful man, powerful leader sort of way, which, of course, we have actually seen the world move into that direction too, right? Any sort of transcendent outside of the state, reality is gone. So it's only the state that now determines everything. But on an individualistic level, we have to become gods. We have to become the source of our meaning. We have to become source of our identity. And by the way, from God, we get our standards of perfection. And to, to this questioner's point, a lot of the message is, I mean, you think about the kind of the new way to do modeling and everything else, embrace your imperfection. Now, some of that message is good because we have a Photoshop version of perfection. But when you start talking about moral imperfection and just embrace that or the lack of virtue and just embrace that as if it's good or take something that's wrong and make it right. See, that's what happens when we ourselves become God's to appear worthy of the death of God. And I, I just think, man, I, I've been going back to the parable of the madman a bunch of times in the recent months. And I think this is an example. He predicted you lose these sort of transcendent categories without God. Then it, everything takes an inward turn. Everything takes an inward focus. Even, By the way, even religion takes an inward focus. So God's most important job in your life is to endorse you. <laughs> and that's, that was the whole Glenn and Doyle point in that article. So just, a, just a lot to unpack here, but I think it's an example of expressive individualism. It's varied over time. And I think even recently, I would say that Disney uh, as a studio, not, not in terms of a company, cause they own Pixar now, but in terms of a studio and their own, their releases, they have more moral misses than Pixar does. I see Disney's work as, as a little bit more problematic in many ways than Pixar's work because Pixar has like a two out of three success rate in terms of, of, conveying a good and meaningful and, and and sort of wholesome moral message. And I'll, I'll point to what I'm talking about. With the more recent films, you do see exactly the kind of attitude that this listener is talking about with that inward guide and the, the bucking of perfection in favor of who you really are and expressing your individual identity. But there are exceptions to that. I would point to, for instance, uh, Moana, which was a Disney feature that wasn't Pixar, even though it kind of looks like Pixar. Uh, and I think maybe some of the same people worked on the animation, but Moana was very much about conforming yourself to some external reality and then bringing your whole community into that and renewing it in a new way. That was, that was an interesting thing to me. I saw that as positive. I didn't see it as, is the same thing that Disney has done lately. And part of the reason for that is different people work on different features, right? And there's no set in stone master narrative. At least I don't think there is, but Pixar has done this even better. My favorite recent Pixar film was Coco which was kind of underrated and underappreciated mostly because it had this day of the dead imagery from Mexico, which is really odd. But I greatly enjoyed that one because it was all about the sacrificing of individual dreams and desires 
on the altar of love for others, love for community and love for tradition. And the way the main character sort of redeems his own family's tradition out of a deception shows that it's all about honoring the past and so forth. It's a very conservative movie. So there's, it's a mixed bag, you know, Disney and Pixar are, are turning out a, a series of films that in many ways tell contradictory messages. And if you want to see those contradictory messages encapsulated in a single film and the confusion displayed, go back and watch Zootopia. Zootopia looks like it's going to be a straightforward, you know, feminist story. And then it ends up juking the feminism with another form of oppression, another oppression dynamic. And some people have looked at that and said, oh, it's all about intersectional progressive theory, that there are these all these oppression dynamics that intersect at different points. But it kind of subverts itself. And that was interesting to me. So I, I could talk on and on about this because I've watched these things with my kids and I think through the messages that they're conveying. But it's not I wouldn't paint it quite as negatively as, as this listener does, although I certainly see a lot of, you know, subversive and misleading themes coming across as well. There has been a bunch of Christians that have worked at Pixar. I don't know what the current status is, but I know that there are a lot of Christians in Hollywood trying to do some of these things. And and it is a mixed bag. I, I think there's a, it's a good example of Chesterton who said, when you stop believing in God, you start believing in anything. You know, Disney knows how to make a lot of money. And th that, that, you know, don't, don't ever doubt what's kind of ultimately driving some of these things. But the key is to have these conversations with your kids. I, I don't say you have to watch everything or not watch everything. You've certainly seen more than I have, Shane. But I think these are great. Don't, don't let things go and act and, and hope that they went unnoticed. Because when these ideas show up in these movies and they seem normal, that's when they're most powerful in shaping our hearts and minds. We, we need something to sit wrong. We need to notice like, oh, wait, that's not right. That's not true. And when th that, that's a great way not only to talk about really important ideas with your kids, but also get them into the habit of being discerning, being active in their hearts and minds whenever they encounter anything, whether it's a message of friendship or a book, uh, some message in a book or a movie or a song or whatever. It's just a good habit to get into. I, I'm really surprised you haven't seen more of these movies, John, given that you have all these, all these girls. I only have one girl currently a second on the way, but oh, we were on a streak. Trust me. We were on a streak now, but <laughs> we uh, directed my son towards the Marvel movies, which he loves. And, but now we got to second guess all that stuff too, because there's some dumb stuff happening in Marvel. So, well, co well the comic book genre has always been a little bit frivolous and, and ridiculous, but even there, you know, there's some, there's some contradictory stuff. You get something like Captain Marvel, which is very straightforward, sort of, you know, bad girl feminist sort of thing like it, this. She dominates everyone and everything and essentially acts like a man the entire time. But then you get something like Black Panther, which was, I mean, many people have strong feelings about that. But to me, the message of Black Panther looked like it was straight out of Thomas Sowell. You know, it's like, don't just don't just sit in your sense of aggrievement and oppression, actually rise up and make the world a better place through taking on responsibility and engaging with those in need and using the treasures that have been given to you from the past in a positive way. So, yeah, it, it, I love talking about these things with people because sometimes a big company like Disney or, you know, their various studios that they own got a house full of kids, you know, you get Marvel over here, you got Pixar over here. Sometimes their interest is to make something that's a little bit like a Rorschach test that anybody can read in the in a way that's affirming of their beliefs. And so they're kind of, you know, trying to trying to walk the tightrope in that sense. But that's an interesting discussion and I, I really appreciate the question. We gotta take a quick break, folks. We'll be right back after this to answer more of your questions. Stay with us. Christians sometimes hear that besides prayer, what can we do? And at the Colson Center, we understand that prayer is doing something. Prayer is one way, in fact, it's many times the best way to bridge profound disconnection that exists, it exists in different cultural contexts. But as we understand this cultural moment right now, at the Colson Center, we believe that prayer is one of the most profound ways to bridge generation gaps that exist in society. The vast worldview differences that are around generations often mean that the many times grandparents, parents, and other people that are in our communities find it increasingly difficult to talk to the children and the youth that are in our churches and in our society. Many times parents feel very isolated, stranded between their child and a cultural intent captivating their hearts and their minds. 
And many times young people simply don't know how to interact with anyone who isn't of their own age group. Well, the Colson Center this month is offering a special resource. It's called Pray For Me. It's a prayer guide that helps parents, adults in different communities, and even grandparents pray for the generational divides that exist inside of our culture. For a gift of any amount to the Colson Center during this month, you can receive this prayer guide. You can sign up for the adult prayer guide, the grandparent prayer guide, or the parent prayer guide. To take advantage of this offer, simply visit colsoncenter.org forward slash February. Again, that's colsoncenter.org forward slash February and make a gift of any amount to receive the Pray For Me prayer guides. We're back here on the Breakpoint podcast and our Q&A segment, Ask the Colson Center, answering your questions from a Christian worldview perspective. John, we've talked a good bit recently about IVF surrogacy and other assisted reproductive technologies, and it sparked a series of questions from our listeners and readers that have been very good and thoughtful and thought provoking or provoking a further conversation on these questions. And we've got just such a question today, and it has to do with those who have already gone through with some of these procedures and have already gotten it tangled up with many of the moral complications that attend those procedures. This is very personal and it's, it's very sad in a way, but it offers us a chance, I think, to, to talk about, well, you know, if you're not in the stage where you're planning to do this and could be dissuaded from using some of these technologies that are morally questionable, what if you've already done so? What then? How do you work through the problems then? And that's where this listener is and where this question comes from. This person says, I listened with interest to Shane's interview with Stephanie Gray Connors and subsequent discussion with Wayne Stender about IVF and surrogacy. It raised a few moral and ethical concerns I hadn't considered before. A lot of the discussion was very beneficial for those who are considering IVF to think about in order to make morally informed decisions. Can I please present you with a real life dilemma and ask for your wisdom? A Christian couple underwent IVF almost 20 years ago. They went into it fully planning to give each embryo the chance at life. The first implant was successful and led to a healthy daughter who's now 17. The second implant resulted in twins who are now 15. Complications in the pregnancy led them to being born at 27 weeks, so premature. Through a series of medical situations, the dad suffered a brain injury and now also needs full-time care. It never seemed like an appropriate time for mom to give the other embryos a chance. At 50 and now post-menopausal, that window of opportunity has passed. She's considered offering them up for infertile couples, but knows that she'd have no say to who they go to. As a Christian, she'd ideally like them to go to Christian families, but there's no guarantee that they wouldn't go to unbelievers or even same-sex couples. Up to this point, she's paid what she refers to as blood money to keep them on ice, as she knows it's wrong to kill them. But with the argument about preventing them from having either life or eternal life, I think a decision has to be made. It is immoral to leave them in suspended animation indefinitely. As you often say, ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims. So my question is, when there are only wrong moral choices before you because of past decisions made with good intent, but ultimately fraught with bad outcomes, what's the lesser evil? To donate the children to families that might raise them contrary to Christian beliefs and maybe not receive eternal life, to leave the children on ice or remove life support and allow the children to die, thus allowing them eternal life. I imagine she isn't the only parent struggling with this sort of decision when well-laid plans have met with reality. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as it didn't seem to get touched on in any of the podcasts. Yeah, boy, this is an example of the moral complexities that happen when technologies outpace ethics. You know, we, we sometimes think about sin or evil as kind of dropping a, a rock into a glass of water. And so we just got to take the rock back out and everything will be uh, well. It, it's more like dropping dye into water. It just permeates and getting, ba- getting it back clear again is a, is a much more difficult process. And that's one of the reasons we've talked about it for so long is that there's a level of moral complexity. There's a level of consequence. And we've actually got now a human rights crisis. And that's a really hard thing to ethically navigate when so much of the world, including so much of the church, don't even know it's a cri- there is a crisis out there at all. And it's a human rights crisis that's grown now to a scale that's pretty astonishing. You know, like what we said, a, a million or so babies is the estimate just in the United States of uh, embryos that are just kept on ice. 
uh, the way the current industry runs, one in six or one in seven embryos that are created through IVF will never be given a chance at life or implantation. And, and this is what happens when you get kind of this far into the mess. Getting back out of the mess ethically becomes a very, very complicated and difficult thing. One of the things I think is helpful to at least apply to the framework is what is a created good and what is a benefit specifically of Christians. Life itself is a created good prior. In other words, human life is a good thing, biblically speaking. Eternal life obviously is renewed human life. And so the choice here that's presented between, you know, I don't want to take the risk of them not going to heaven you know, maybe it'd be best just to let let them die. This it seems to me to be kind of a framework that could be applied in kind of the the classic trot out the toddler argument. You know, you and I don't have guarantees that our children will come to faith. We don't have guarantees that either ourselves or somebody else isn't going to screw things up and confuse their view of God. And, uh, you know, wouldn't it be safer then? I actually had a pro-abortion activist once ask me this. He's like, well, wouldn't that be better since you think, you know, babies go to heaven just to kill the babies if you think it's a baby anyway. And then, you know, there's not a chance they would go to hell. And the answer to that, of course, is what kind of people are humans? They're made in the image and likeness of God. Their value is intrinsic to them, whether or not they go to heaven or not, you know, to an extent that they bear God's image. Even non-believers bear God's image. And that is where the value comes from. It's a, it's a, it's a value that gets fully restored and either enhanced in Christ Jesus, but it's not a value that doesn't exist just because of, of sin. So in other words, I I just don't like that alternative. And I think the same sort of reasoning would apply to any parent wanting to have a child. You know, we wouldn't apply it that way. So this is kind of the trot out the toddler thing. The next thing I would say is, is that there are Christian adoption agencies. In fact, it was a Christian adoption agency that first pioneered this whole adoption of excess, quote unquote, excess embryos from in vitro fertilization clinics and what's called snowflake adoptions. That was the the title. Back at the beginning of 2020, I had on my podcast, Hannah Stregge and her mom and dad. Hannah was the first snowflake adoption that we know of. She just graduated from Biola. And by the way, she wants to spend her career advocating against in vitro fertilization as a product of in vitro fertilization. It's a, it's a fascinating story. Story, strong believer. In other words, it was Christians who pioneered this. The organization that pioneered this is known as Nightlight Christian Adoptions, and their program is called Snowflakes, the Embryo Adoption Program. Now, this is a Christian organization. That doesn't mean I, I don't know what the legalities here. When you when you start talking about you know Bethany Christian Services and you know their decision to start offering adoption services to same sex couples. And when we, we've we spoken out against that decision, we thought that that was the wrong decision. In fact, it proved legally to be the wrong decision just a few months after they made it because of what Catholic Charities did in standing up to the state of Michigan. No same-sex couple had come to them demanding a child. So you you have the fact that when you when you start thinking about embryo adoption, you're right. There's not a guarantee that a Christian family, so to speak, will be among the adoptive families. But there's not a whole lot of non-Christians doing embryo adoption. It's just not a value. Why? Well, same-sex couples oftentimes have this really kind of strange fascination. And by the way, infertile couples do as well with having our own kid. So a a large majority of people who adopt in general do it for religious reasons. Religious people are far more likely to adopt than non-religious people. When you start talking about embryo adoption, no one's even talking about embryos as made in the image and likeness of God and therefore should be preserved. And we should, in other words, there's not a reason to go through embryo adoption on a worldview level that I can think of, maybe there's a few, but nothing like if you're a Christian. So I think the vast majority of adoptive parents in this space are going to be believers. And I think that the answer for this individual is to, first of all, call Nightlight, Christian Adoptions who pioneered this. Go to nightlight.org, look up their Snowflake program, call them and ask these questions. It's kind of like the atypical adoption process. In other words, yeah, I think you can you know, be involved in this. It's not just kind of to, to throw it out there and then whatever happens, happens. So I think you'll find the scenario is a little bit different. I'm not saying there's never a chance that this worst, you know, fear that this person has would come true. But I do think that it, it's unlikely. And I, and I think that 
do a little bit more research and see if I'm wrong on this one. I think Nightlight would help you in this regards. I think that the vast majority of couples looking to adopt embryos are going to be believers. And I also think that life itself is a good in and of itself. And that's why we choose to have children, even though that same risks of them not necessarily having eternal life, you know, exist. And that's, of course, why it's so painful when a parent has a child walk away from the faith. But it's just as likely a scenario. Maybe not just as likely, but it's as likely a scenario. And we choose to have children anyway, because it's a vote, a vote for the future. It's a vote for hope. That's why adoption also is a vote for hope. And embryo adoption, I think, is one of those beautiful, amazing ways to try to overcome evil with good. Yeah, I'll just mention that I had an interview a while back on Upstream with Dr. Jeffrey Keenan, who leads the National Embryo Donation Center. And this is their work, is placing frozen embryos that no longer have a chance to come to term in the family that conceived them, but have an opportunity now to do so in a new family. And that was a, a very good perspective. And his thoughts on the whole issue were helpful to me in many ways and understanding how, how to respond to brokenness rather than contributing to uh, additional brokenness. So I really appreciated that. Well, we're out of time for today, folks. Thanks so much for joining us on the Breakpoint Podcast and our Q&A segment, Ask the Colson Center. If you've got a question you'd like us to take a shot at here on the podcast, all you have to do is email us. The address is asktheColsoncenter at colsoncenter.org. For John Stone Street and the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris, and we'll see you next week.